Going to find the right one. Go live. Hitting the button. All right. Got the notes. Corley Moore. Firehouse Vigilance. Weekly Scrap. Number 146. My guest this evening is the average Jake. He is Robbie Owens. He has been in the fire service since age 15. He is currently with Henrico Fire. He is an FDIC firehouse instructor. He is the host of the Average Jake Firefighter Podcast, the Average Jake Firefighter Blog. He's a husband. He's a father. Uh, and most importantly, he is passionate about the fire service. And I'm excited for tonight's conversation. Uh, welcome, my brother, Robbie Owens, to Weekly Scrap number 146. Man, thank you for having me, Corley. Just a tremendous, tremendous honor to be asked to, to be on the scrap. Obviously an avid listener. Uh, listen to the podcast version. Listen to the live version just uh, just tremendous, tremendous honor to be asked to, to be on the scrap, especially with the caliber of people you've had on here. Uh, just just awesome. Ready to do this. And, I, and that's what that's what makes this whole thing, this whole experience for me surreal is because I listened to I read the average Jake and I listened to the average Jake and I followed him on Twitter. And one of the things for me was just to uh, for you to say that to me now is like this whole full circle thing, <laughs> of how much influence you had on me, you know, in the fire service. And so 100 percent. Uh, thank you for being a guest. Uh, anything I missed in the intro, anything you would like to add? Uh, you know, just, uh, like you said, I think you covered a lot of it. Just, uh, I, I really care about the fire service, man. Like I, I don't consider myself like anything necessarily special. Like that's where the kind of the average Jake thing came from. Right. But, uh, you know, just, you know, I, I just, I love the fire service. It's been a passion of mine since I was a young kid. I come from a fire service family. My dad's a firefighter. Uh, my brother's a firefighter. My sister didn't want to be one. So she married one. Nice. Um, so it's just, that's just like, this is what we do. My mom isn't, was an EMT. Uh, you know, like I just come from a, a fire service family. So, I mean, this is just what we do. It is quite literally in your DNA. <laughs> Absolutely. There is. Yeah. No doubt about it. Uh, 100%. Audience, get your questions ready for Robbie and myself. Get your questions ready for the average Jake. This should get interesting. Um, I mentioned Kyle Romagus. Chief Romagus usually comes in here and he curates your questions and he will throw them at me on my laptop, which is sitting here beside me. Uh, one thing I want to say, the vigilantes, it is the, 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 I want to mention this at the start of every scrap now, and that is the private group for those that support the scrap. Uh, the vigilantes is live and it is a fun, fun discussion and, and it's great to be a part of. If you want to be a part of it, go to firehousevigilance.com and you can see it all about it there. So that, that's my housekeeping at the front. Marco Isom said, good evening, fellow scrappers. Let's get it on. Ryan King said, let's get this party started. Jim Platt said, let's go with one, two, three, four O's and three oh, exclamation wow. points. <laughs> so you know it's time. Danny Owen said, representing the Fireground Commander Central Virginia Firefighter Conference. So I don't know if Danny Owens is related, but absolutely. Uh, that's, my, that's my brother. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, man. And, and the Fireground Commander Conference. What can you say? Yeah, that's probably my favorite thing these days that I do in the fire service. Uh, you got to come out and attend, uh, not this year's, but last year's. And uh, man, what a true. And, and, and I'm just lucky to be a part of it. Uh, my good friend Ben Martin started this thing, you know, five, six years ago. And, uh, man, just a tremendous, tremendous opportunity that he gave me to help him. Uh, and just we've been able to bring now 30 high-level FDIC-level presentations in, yes. uh, to, the, to the area. Uh, so it's just like – it's probably my favorite thing. It is a labor of love. I mean, probably about two months out from the conference, we're, we're really exhausted. But, man, <laughs> when it's going on, it is awesome. And then it fires you up and you want to do it again. Like we oh, immediately yeah. go back into planning mode. So no, no, you had, I, I just, yeah, like, it's my favorite you, thing. You had Von Oppen and, and, and Pennington. And I was trying to think of everything, but it was there when I was there. And then this yeah. last time you had Dina Ali and Jason Patton. And yeah, Bill, Bill Gustin, Hazel. Gustin, yeah, Gustin, like, yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was awesome. And then the next year we've got uh, Ray McCormick and Shannon Stone, DJ Stone, Lex Shady, Chris Tobin. I mean, just a host. I, I'm going to leave somebody else. I don't want to try to get everybody. I think Sean Duffy coming so it's just it, again it's it's one of my favorite things that i do every year in the fire service now like uh, i can't imagine when i mean ben said the goal is to go to 10 years uh so we're halfway there nice. um uh, we're halfway there so uh hopefully we'll be able to continue it even past that even if we're done in 10 years hopefully we'll be able to pass what we've built on to someone else nice no i love it man I, and dude again it's a great thing you got going on uh so first question out the gate i want to start with the podcast and your journey 
you are a passionate guy and you love to share the message. So talk to me about how that started for you and how you got into doing this. Well, so, and we kind of were talking offline as well. Like this has just been something that I, again, I, I came from a fire service family. My dad's a firefighter. He just retired uh, last year at age 62. Oh, wow. um, he was still on the line and, and, and he just, he, it's funny. He's been retired a year. And he said that uh, if the pandemic hadn't happened, he'd probably still be working because he was the uh, he was the oldest firefighter in his department. And so they were like scared, like they thought he was going to get COVID and die. Right. Right. Like, right. <laughs> so they're like, what do we do with him? Um, you know, you got to so go. He, you got to go. <laughs> yeah. So he hung on for a little bit. Uh, and uh, so but like I said, I, I come from a fire service family and this all started. There's probably like two halves to my life, I guess, is uh, when I was growing up big time into sports, uh, wrestling was my was my sport of choice. I was a, uh, uh, I, w- I won't say I was a big time wrestler, but I liked it. Um, we wrestled in uh, started at age five or six, wrestled in high school, wrestled in middle school for very competitive uh, teams. And uh, man, then I went to that firehouse when I was 15. I went to the Mechanicsville Volunteer Fire Department. My dad was a volunteer there. He took me there. And, you know, like I knew my dad was a firefighter, but it wasn't something that you know, you really pay attention to, right? Uh, we had firefighters in our family, you know, like he's your dad. Like he, I thought of him more as like my coach, you know right. what I mean? And like my right. father, then he's a firefighter, right? It didn't, it didn't really like add up. Uh, and then we had a fire in our neighborhood and I was like, and it was a guy I really looked up to. And I was like, what's Mr. Chris do? Oh, he's a firefighter and he works for Henrico Fire. Oh, what's that about? And he volunteers at Mechanicsville Fire Department. Oh man, what's that about? So he took me up there. He was volunteering there. And that was it, man. I found out that you could join the volunteer fire department and I was hooked. And it was just like, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you're meant to do with your life. I came in in a really cool time where you could get firefighter one and two at age 16. Uh, so I did. I pretty much quit wrestling uh, and got my firefighter one and two and my EMT. And, uh, you know, by age 20, uh, I, I went off to college at, after high school, but I wasn't ready to go to college. Like I, I was... I wasn't mature enough to go to college, to be quite honest. Um, but I spent some time at Eastern Kentucky University. And then I uh, I got hired in Stafford County Fire Rescue at age 20. And then achieved my dream of being a Henrico firefighter at age 22. Nice. Uh, and so how and that the, was around uh, 2004? Yeah, that was right yeah. at, in 2004. Yeah, about, okay. it's, it's been 18 years ago, uh, okay. which was, which is pretty crazy uh, to think. Because uh, I still feel like I'm like 25, even though I'm 40. Hey, join um, the club, brother. I, I, I know the feeling. <laughs> but uh, but then so as you know, you, you progress on in your career, going to classes and and going to things. And so how the average Jake stuff started was we I was going to classes with a bunch of motivated guys. And I just felt like I had something to share and, and no way to share it. Right. Just felt like maybe that like we would go to this cl- like one of the big stories about it was going to class and. uh in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they're talking about how they do a two and a half inch hand line and they have four people on the line. And I'm like, and we ask the instructor, Hey, can we do it with two? And he looks at us crazily. He's like, why, yeah. why would you want to do that? This is going to be tough. And I'm like, yeah, but that's all we got. That's what so we got. Yeah. Right. Right. That's all we got. So if we don't have, if we can't do it with two, then we can't do it. I think right. your technique is great. So he let us do it. We were able to do it. And uh, we were just kind of like being my bunch of my buddies were, were talking. I was like, there, we've got a lot of things that we're doing very well here in Henrico Fire with our three person engine. Right. Like or with our three person ladder truck or our two person ambulance. And, and, and we feel like maybe we should share some of it. And I was the only one that had the guts enough to, to pull the trigger on it. And so Average Jake was, was kind of born and it started off as a, as a blog and a, and a Twitter handle. Uh, and it morphed into a podcast. And uh, to be honest, I think I'm a little better at the podcast. I'm not, I don't think I'm a, the world's greatest writer. Um, and especially the way that I write is more like inspiration versus like my, my wife is a like technical writer. Give her a topic, she'll research it and she can knock it out. And it'll be like the best thing you've ever read. Me, like I have to be inspired to write. So blogging was kind of tough, but talking on a microphone is, is kind of easy for me and I'm better at the nice. spoken word. So so the, the average Jake thing was just kind of, it blossomed into the podcast. And now we've got like 57 episodes of the podcast and been some great guests and, and it's just a great medium. And, and I've actually been able to turn that into to creating opportunities for other people, very similar to what I was looking for when I was trying to start this whole thing. Nice, man. I love it. I love, I love the journey and, and especially, uh, 
talking versus writing or writing versus talking. I don't care which way you fall, but but it definitely uh, uh, rings true, you know, uh, with me. Um, so with all that being said, I always when I'm doing a scrap and I get a new guest and some, especially someone I look up to, uh, even though I don't know you, but I look up to the average Jake, you know, the persona. And so I always ask for topics to you want to discuss and something I can research. And one of the topics you sent and it really intrigued me. It was the three hours. Um, that's all you sent was the three hours. And I wanted to know and, and, and hear, hear your take on what do you mean by the three hours? And so the three hours, it's something that actually kind of, it came out of compromise, right? Like, and, and, it, and it came out of being a, a motivated guy and, and kind of alienating some people, to be quite honest with you, with how like motivated I was and how much I wanted to train and like how much, like, and I still sometimes do that, right? Like just this past like Father's Day on Sunday, uh, we had the opportunity to take advantage of some abandoned houses, right? Like the, the whole apartment complex that they're tearing down. And like, I'm the type of guy that I don't miss that opportunity, right? Yep, I was tired. Uh, we had celebrated Father's Day the night before, you know, so we stayed up late and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you tell me that there's like seven apartment buildings that I can do anything that I want to. Yes. Uh, we're, go- we're, we're going. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I did that a lot as a firefighter, a fire officer. Um, and it was kind of a, a compromise that it came about to, all right, what's, what can I, and I had, and at the time I had a very like not motivated crew or at least not as motivated as I was. And it was, Hey man, like, how can I get, how can I still do the things that I think we need to do, but I can also compromise with these guys and let them get the quote unquote downtime that they think they need. Cause some of them were older than I was. Right. Like I, I I mean, like I said, I got hired when I was 22. I got promoted uh, right about when I was 30 you know, so I was still pretty, you know, and I'm still like super motivated. I don't know if you can tell I'm pretty high energy guy, uh, you know, but so the three hours came about as like, all right, so what's the minimum that we need to do to, to accomplish these things every day? And so the, the things that I think we need to do. So the three hours are one hour in the library, one hour in the gym and one hour hands on training. So what do I mean by one hour Ooh. in the library. Uh, one hour in the library is essentially like I, I, some people think it's just reading to me. It can be whatever you want it to be. Like you can watch fire ground, YouTube videos. You can read you know, fire engineering. You can read firehouse, pick your favorite fire book and read it, find an article. You know what I mean? Hey, share it with everybody at the kitchen table, print out an SOG, print out an EM, e, <coughs> EMS, uh, print out an EMS <laughs> protocol. Right. Uh, you know, I, I joke, but legit, like anything that you can do, to like read something to do with our job every day. Make right? you better. Put, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It make you better. Read an article, do something, get on. I like, lo- I like looking at YouTube. I like reading, you know, like looking at fire videos, like people call it fire porn, right? I'm a Saturn. I one one guy every day. Yeah. Uh, like Phil I'm looking Joe, at sir. Yeah. Insert, insert. Yeah. Whoever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Insert whoever. Uh, David Decker. I love yes. watching David Decker videos on YouTube. Uh, so like, that's me. Like I do that every day. Um, and so do something like, every day the one hour in the gym i i don't think it's any uh secret that you got to be in pretty decent shape to do this right like and and i'm not talking about uh you know like six-pack abs trust me you don't want to see me with my shirt off right like i'm not a calendar guy right but it's join the club yes (laughs) but it's all but it's all about working right like you know i put in the effort yeah like get out there and do something you know that you can that you can put the you know, that, that mimics the fire ground, right? Like I've said for like, we don't need Ferraris on the fire service. We need dump trucks. We need something that can do work, take a beating and keep on going. Right. Like that's what we need. And that's the type of work we should be doing. So getting out there in the gym for an hour every day, and then an hour of hands on training, which is like putting your hands on the tools that we use, stretching line, uh, you know, forcing a door searching, and it doesn't have to be anything super crazy. Right. Like you can get out in the bay in your shorts and a T-shirt with a hose bundle and sh- all right, pick a door and just stretch, stretch yes. and stretch for an hour. Like it doesn't have to be the world's like most extravagant thing in, the, in you know, so those are that's the three hours. And I try to incorporate that into every it really for me every day, uh, but at least every shift day, those 10 days a month that you're working. 
um, and try to spend those three hours do you know at least doing something like that because of course we're trying to fit calls in we're trying to fit you know I mean and you got to sleep like you know you do have to sleep like it's it's important to you you have to uh, sleep know, you have the, to eat you have to do high right, rents, you right. Know, you got to you know, right you, we have daily what, duties insert. yeah we got to check the SCBA we got to do the EMS check we got to do commercial hazard assessments tra- you know all that kind of stuff so that three hours is like that minimum of what you should be doing every day and I try to incorporate that into what I do. And I try to preach that to anybody who's out there. And especially if you're feeling overwhelmed, just try to put it in those little bites. It's three hours, man. It's only three. It's three of 24 hours. We're working 24 hour shifts, three of 24 hours that you can do that. I guarantee it, it, it'll take some of that stuff you're overwhelmed with, uh, especially like rookies, new firefighters who have nothing, who have nothing to base it off of, you know, break it down into a more manageable chunk for them so that sure. they're not so overwhelmed. No, absolutely, man. It, it just just as a rookie trying to fill up an eight-hour workday before they get to the evening where they're trying to still stay busy and you know hooked up, you know. But uh, if you can break it up with that, man, a hundred percent. So I'm gonna catch you up. Um, we got lots of people chiming in. Uh, Tony Nunez says that's good stuff. If you actually plan to dedicate an hour, you will ultimately get more than that out of it. No excuses as not enough time. And that's a great, Absolutely. great point, man. Uh, Randy Feltner said, I second the motion on the floor for the three hours. <laughs> and then Ryan Pennington, he had a few things to say. He said, listen to the Average Jake podcast. you got to spend an hour listening to the Average Jake. Well, you totally can. And, and that, you know, that sometimes I take that hour, that, that one hour in the library, one hour of PT, and I listen to a, I, I listen to the weekly scrap or, or a fire podcast. That's killing two birds with one stone, folks. Hundred percent. You know yes. what I mean? Like I can get on that treadmill and then I can get some some good stuff going on, you know, in my brain. And I can tell you that's a lot of times when I have some of my best uh, like thoughts or opinions or, or epiphanies in the fire service is when I'm off on that trail run and I've got a podcast in my ears. I, there's nothing else going on. There's no distractions, and I'm thinking like my brain's engaged, right? Like. Uh, it, it, that's when I have a lot of like, that's when I come up with some of my best training ideas, some of my best like articles, some of my best podcast topics, or even some like, even some of my best like family topics. Like I'll like call my wife in the middle of a run. Like, did we think about this? Like, I just, you know, <laughs> it's just like, stop breathing so hard, you know, like, <laughs> you know, so, but, but legit like that, that is to me, that is like that bare minimum. And again, it was, it was born out of a little bit of compromise, which I think is okay. Like some people. No, no, it's beautiful. It's beautiful because not everybody. And that's, that's what's so hard for some people who are so engaged in the job is to understand that not everybody is as engaged as you are. Uh, Have you had good success with, with, with preaching the, Hey guys, give me three hours. Here's the deal. Here's what I want. Boom. boom, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, and it really, it's, it sparked a lot of that crew. Now the caveat too, though, is we're going to get those three hours in. Right. So you got to be willing to do that. So, the, you know, hey, if you want to screw around and, you know, like not get after it when we get here, like and I'm a, I'm a big I don't believe in a lot of busy work. Right. I, we do what we need to do and we get it done. Right. So if you want to be done by two o'clock in the afternoon, let's get after it. Right. Like, let's go do our thing. But trust me, we're going to get that hour of training in, even if it's after dinner. Right. Right. So, right. so we're going to, and so when, when you, when you present it like that, like, no, these, this is not optional. Like we're doing, and of course, within reason, right? Like, sure. if you, like if, if you're running 15, 20 calls a shift and you, and you're and it's 10 o'clock at night, all right, let's skip something. Okay. But like most of the time, there's usually plenty of time. If you, if you come to work and you're looking to go and, and looking to get after it and looking to do the things that you need to do and do the right things. I, I've, I've been at the busiest station in our department. And I've never not had time to get it done. Nice. No. And like you said, there's always those points where you just get smoked. You know, the yeah, the, absolutely. the calls come in and you get smoked. And and no one is, yep. is, is the point is, is when that happens, everybody's like, hey, we earn this day. And then, yeah. but there's the opposite where you don't get smoked, but you're like, hey, we had a call. So, you know, let's. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, uh, uh, let's, let's. Yeah. yeah. Let's, yeah. It looks like rain, guys. Maybe we yeah. should call it a day. Like, take it easy. Like, no. Like, let's let's go right get on. this thing. That's the that's the point of the whole thing. So, well, to me, that's oh. the fun stuff, man. Like those three hour stuff too. Hey, maybe it's not fun for everybody, but like that's fun for me. Somebody when we had those apartments the other day, like my my boss, uh, who's our shift commander was like, you're just in your element over here. I had a huge smile on my face. I'm like going around like, oh yeah, I just forced five doors. Like it's great. I'm out of breath and I'm tired. Like this is awesome. You know, this is the fun stuff. Like if you didn't, 
you know, and again, everybody gets into this job for different reasons or whatever. But if going and doing our job is not what is what's not fun for you, then then I, you probably are in the wrong place. And that's OK. It's OK to be in the wrong place as long as you go find the right place. Right. Yes. But like like I mean, like if, if going and forcing a door, or flowing water in a building or or do, like if that's not fun, man, like I, 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 I feel sorry for you. Because right. you're clearly you're gonna have a long career. You're gonna right hate on. it, Dude, without a doubt. Especially if you work with me, you're gonna have a long yeah. career. And you're, gonna you're gonna have hate a it. long day, man. You're gonna <laughs> hate it. And you know, and 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 you talk about the the successful the success of it. Um, I I, I feel like I'm I, I'm pretty good at like maintaining that standard, right? Like we're not gonna. And sometimes, as they say, sometimes if if you just as long as you're fair and you maintain that standard. Uh, you're going to get the shift that you want, right? Either yes. guys are going to either get on board or they're going to get off and that's okay. Right. Like it, it, I don't take it personal, right? Like a lot of times we ended up, I've always ended up with a crew that really wanted to do the things that I thought we needed to do and, and wanted to be about the job. And it may, it maybe take, take some time, but you know, it, it's, it's all good stuff. And I think it's a very, and this, this is my personal experience and, and talking to people, but I think there's a very low percentage of people who just, absolutely do not want to be into the job it's like they just need the opportunity to to be the best yeah. version of themselves in the job does that make sense i know i i, I totally i totally understand and I, and I agree like sometimes it feels like i've had people come to me and be like like I, I don't know if i can go do this i'm like what do you mean what do you mean you don't know if you can go do this well like my, my officer doesn't want to train i was like you don't need his permission bro i was 100%. like like le legit like you got, I was like, you got a, a hose bundle in that firehouse. Yep. You got a fire, you got a fire hydrant out front. Yep. You got a reducer. Yeah. Cool. You got a nozzle. Yeah. All right. Cool. Go hook it up to that hydrant and practice hose movements. You can do that. <laughs> like I, I, and I've been there, man. Like I've been on those shifts that were unmotivated. They didn't want to do anything. And a lot of the, and I came up there's, uh, there. I came up with a lot of drills that I could do by myself. You know, I had one, I posted the other day on the, on the Facebook page, the self rip bottle. I, that that was created out of people not wanting to do anything, and granted, definitely created out of me being immature and not being able to uh, explain to them at the time like sure. hey, why we needed to do this or you know again my your as I call it my passion overrode my mouth, um, which happens. Uh, but like that was created out of me out of that necessity. Like hey man, I don't want to not be good. So right. like, I'm not like, I want to go out and do these things. So, you know, I, I created some things that I could do on my own. Absolutely. And Robbie, I want to tell you, sometimes I'm quiet because it's like such a great sound bite coming at me. I want to, I want to oh, not, okay. I, ru I, ha I have ruined so many sound bites by going, <laughs> yes, yes. You know? <laughs> so oh, that's all right. Sometimes I gotta, I gotta, I gotta choke back <laughs> myself so that I don't ruin the sound bite. So sometimes I'm writing down like. 2118 training great soundbite that's my little note right that's there awesome, uh, awesome. uh david mcdaniel said this dude gets it who wouldn't want to work for him so creative uh ryan king said you're only limited by your own mind absolutely tony nunez said motivate them to the retirement line if that's the case if they aren't ready to retire then they don't know enough yeah uh someone asked yeah. a question and and smoothbore kyle romagus himself said t safe and I love oh, yeah. it, man, because this stuff yeah. ain't for everybody. It ain't for everybody. That's, That's right. the PG it's, and version, it's not, but absolutely. Yeah, no, and 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 you're and he's exactly right. Like, and, and I hate to, you, you know, you don't want to like kill anybody's uh, dream or whatever. But this, I think that's one of the worst things we ever did was tell everybody, at least in in my department, right, or around here in this a thousand area of Virginia, percent, man. We told anybody that we could do it, and we could teach you how to do it. And I'm not saying you can't learn how to be a firefighter, but man, I'm gonna tell you what, like it it does take a, the right person. Like I can teach you the skills, but you know, I, I can't teach you the, the heart for service. I can't teach you the sacrifice that it takes, you know, that stuff that's all got to come from internal. And, and, and I'm not trying to bag on the new generation because we do get some good firefighters these days. Uh, but we get some ones that don't get it, man. We get some ones that don't get it and are never going to get it. And they, and they shouldn't be in the job. And that's just a fact. And we have people that are on the job that shouldn't do everything in the job. Not everybody on the job site drives a backhoe. So not everybody should drive. Not everybody should be on the ladder truck. Not everybody should be on the rescue. It's just a fact. Not everybody should be in the right front seat. You know, it just it is what it is. It's not fair. It's just like <laughs> Yeah, it is right. Hey man, yeah. I wanted to be an Olympic wrestler and I did not have the talent. It's okay. Like it's my like I found something that I really love to do. 
you know, it is now, what it is. I know you are big into wrestling and your kids, your, your sons mm-hmm. are big into wrestling. Big uh, time. Now, are you still, do you still do anything? Or do you, are you in uh, so I, I, I coach, okay. um, I coach wrestling. Um, I coach the, uh, middle school team that my youngest son is on. I used to run a youth wrestling program till the pandemic and the schools kicked us out. Um, and they have never let us back in. Um, and be quite honest, I ran out of time. I, I had, I, I was trying to pass it off to someone cause I had been doing it, uh, for nine years doing, I mean, and this goes back even further. Like my dad started coaching wrestling, uh, and all that stuff. But then I took over the same program that I joined, that I was a youth wrestler at. Right. Um, you know, so, but then my kids, my oldest son's in, in high school, he's going to be a junior in high school. And so I was going to youth practice and missing matches for him. And I was like, that's not cool. I can't do that. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I can't keep doing this. And so I, so up until the pandemic happened, um, I was still running a youth wrestling program. I still coach every once in a while. Uh, but yeah, like my kids are at a wrestling camp right now. Like right. in Pennsylvania. No, so, I know you. I yeah, knew you were big time. into it. How much? How much of the uh, the coaching plays into your uh, company officer like philosophy, mindset, etc. Um, I, I think the the coaching stuff a little bit. I would say the parenting stuff a, a little bit more right uh, than the, than the coaching stuff, man. Because I can tell you, my boys are awesome, but they are complete opposites. And so, what one what works for one doesn't work for the other. And like, it, I'm, I'm sure my wife is probably listening to this while she's there, but like my youngest son is a lot like me. He's very high energy. He's sarcastic. I think he's hilarious. Uh, but, but, and that gets me in trouble a lot. <laughs> um, and my older son is a lot like my wife. He's, he, she, he's a little bit introverted. He's very intellectual, like very analytical. And my wife is very like that. And so when I'm coming through the door, high energy, be bopping around, like they don't always dig that. Like, you know, you know, and like, they don't always dig me and my younger son's, uh, uh, persona, I guess. Shenanigans. Yeah. yeah. Shenanigans. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> big time, big time. And, uh, like he does not like that. I'll bust in his room and like tackle him on his bed. Like my older son, like my youngest son will laugh his butt off, but my older right. son's like, dad, get out of my room. Um, but that's the same way in the firehouse, right? Like I'm a pretty high energy guy. Like I don't need a lot of, uh, I don't need a lot. Like I, I drink, uh, you know, monsters, but I don't need it. You know what I mean? Like, right. you know, I maybe hit some caffeine in the morning, but, uh, man, I'm bebopping around. I'm usually pretty excited to be at work, man. I'm, I like, I like the fire service. I, I you know, it's like, it's like high school without the homework, right? Like I like, uh, <laughs> I like kicking around the firehouse and I like, you know, the, the antics that go on in the firehouse and I like being high energy. I like going and doing things. I like riding around in the fire truck, but it, uh, not everybody feels that way or not everybody is that way. First thing in the morning, like tomorrow morning, when I roll out of here at five 30 in the morning and I'm at work uh, by six, you know, like I'm going to be bebopping around that firehouse and people are going to be rolling in like, Jesus, man, this guy will not stop. Like I'm checking out the, I'm riding the battalion car tomorrow. So I'll be like checking out. I'm like checking the air pack out at like six ten. People are like, God, would you stop? It's so Just loud. Calm here. down. Bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh you know, but yeah, so I would definitely say that the parenting stuff has helped me more with, with being a company officer and being a leader because my, my family dynamic is so different and uh, people are different in the firehouse and what works for one doesn't work for the others. And so you have to adjust your style. You can't just, you can't just be super rigid and uh, with everything. No, I like it. I like it a lot, especially how much kids teach you about being uh, a leader in the fire service, man. Yeah. between the patients and the and the like my kids are smarter than me you know so it, it's tough oh, it's big tough. time so uh, i knew there would, would be a point where i couldn't help them with their schoolwork, but i didn't know it was going to be so early like <laughs> <laughs> like i was like Woo. like it happened early like yes. especially with my younger one like he's ridiculously smart no it, it the logic the logic circles that my son can take me in and then like oh i just beat you and i'm like mm, okay time to, <laughs> i guess i'm gonna have to beat you up now so, yeah. that's, that's the only way i win this uh, but right. no, uh, Mr. Perfect is something you sent over. Mr. Perfect. One of the topics, the concept that everyone is into the job or that has social media is perfect when the reality is far from that. So go, go into, uh, Mr. Perfect and what you mean by it. Yeah. yeah so, uh, and I, I wrote this in a blog a couple years ago, but like, I, again, like, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a human. I like stuff, you know, it, it, get over that. I like pro wrestling, right? Like I've been a pro wrestling guy, like WWF, AEW, WCW my whole life. I love it. If like you panned over to this side, I've got like two wrestling belts and a action figure of Ric Flair over here. 
So like, like Ooh. I like that. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, but uh, Mr. Perfect was uh, Kurt Henning was a guy who's a wrestling character, and like the outward persona of Mr. Perfect was that he legitimately was perfect. They did all these vignettes with like Wade Boggs where he'd hit a home run, uh, or you know, catch catch an own touchdown pass or something like that. But reality, like Kurt Henning, the guy, Kurt Henning, the the actual human. He he was had kind of a tormented life. I mean, he was he was addicted to to painkillers, uh, you know, drugs. Like, I mean, he died of an overdose. You know what I mean? So like, he was far from from perfect. Uh, and so that's where like some of this online persona, as you said so eloquently in the the beginning, like the average Jake persona. Like people think that oh man, like you know, oh you're the average. I get this at work all the time. Like, oh, you're the average Jake. Well, how'd you screw that up? You know, oh, ha, 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 you know, like all this kind <laughs> right. of stuff. And I know I'm not alone, right? Like, I know that everybody feels, but reality, man, like I'm the most far thing from perfect that there is. Like, I, I care. I, I'm into the job. I read a lot, but I screw things up, man. I, I screw things up and I get a lot of scrutiny. Um, I get a lot of scrutiny just for doing stuff like this. I mean, like I, I didn't get promoted because of something I wrote in a blog. Right. Like that's how crazy is that? Right. Like, <laughs> um, and so it took me years to kind of like to to fix some of that reputation. Um, but that's the thing that I always tell people is like just because someone has a, a podcast or writes or shares doesn't mean they're perfect, man. Like it does. It, in fact, a lot of us are far from it. If you uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were still doing our live burns. And it was funny. Uh, so I'm riding up as a battalion chief right now for the next couple months till they make promotions. And so it was just so happened that Ben Martin was the other battalion chief that was assigned to Live Burns that night. Nice. And we went there and we we were we teamed up as a command. I did command, he did the accountability piece, and and we and we did a great job. Like we killed it. We had a lot of good resp- we had a lot of good uh things, but like during the critique, I named like 10 things that I would do different the next time. Right? Like I was like, "Hey, this didn't go well. This didn't go." And like everyone's like, "What are you talking about, man? Like you you crushed it." I'm like, "Nope. Like this was not this was not perfect at all. Like it wasn't even close. Um, and you know, so that's just the kind of thing I mean by Mr. Perfect. Like just cause someone has all this stuff, just cause someone puts themselves out there, appreciate that they're putting themselves out there, maybe because they're making themselves vulnerable. They're making themselves vulnerable because they feel like they have something to share. Um, that's the weekly scrap. I mean, look how valuable that that's been to everybody. Like I know that I've benefited from it and, uh, but I'm sure you get some people like, Oh, Corley Moore, like, you know, the yep. weekly scrap guy, firehouse vigilance guy, you screwed this up a week ago. Oh yeah. Like, oh, you, know, you know, like it's so it, I, I just say like, I appreciate anybody that puts themselves out there. Even if I don't necessarily like agree with their take, man, when you put yourself out there on a blog or a podcaster or, or an FDIC in front of the top instructors in the country, man, that's, that's a big deal. Don't crush these people. Don't, it, we have a bad habit in the fire service of eating our young. Oh like, yeah. We do. We, we eat our young, man. We kill each other at the kitchen table and just, I, I appreciate anybody that puts themselves out there. Um, and I just, I would like to see that stop. I'd like to see some of the bad shit we say about each other go away and just like, you know, and again, guilty. I've, 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 you know, I think we've all been there, right? Like we've all gotten mad and said something we didn't mean, but like for the most part, like that, that whole, like none of us are perfect. No one's as good as they think they are. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. And when I say you, I mean like everybody listening everybody. out there. Not just you. And me. Uh-huh. And me. Believe me. <laughs> you know, like I don't know everything. You don't know everything. I ain't perfect. You ain't perfect. But we're all, we're all, the one thing we do have in common is that we all care. We all give a shit. And we're all trying that's to be it, as good as we can. So like, I, I just like, we should just stop killing each other. And, and, and that's kind of what I mean by the Mr. Perfect piece. I love it, dude. I love your energy too. Cause you are, you are high energy. That's one thing <laughs> I will absolutely give you. And, and this is something I say all the time is that all of us, every last one of us in this, in this, in this amazing profession are deeply flawed human beings trying to do the best that we can with the tools that we have, you know, and some of us have some fucking broken tools. You know, and, and, and that's what we got to work with, but, uh, we're a hundred percent, man. None of us think that, uh, uh, grace, grace is what we need for each other and grace yeah, is what man. we need moving forward. Especially yeah, these days, especially these days, oh, man, man. <laughs> where things are so out of control and like we, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to talk politics at no, all, but like the, 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 the politics of, of our world like it's alienating people that we have to work with. Right. Like it's so, ripping families apart. I mean, yes, it's ripping families apart. It's ripping firehouses apart. And so like, if you can give a little bit of grace to someone like, man, 
Like that, that is more powerful, I think, than sometimes even taking them out and stretching a hose line with them, right? Like, because everyone needs a little bit of that today, like it, 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 with everything. Because even the job is changing so much, man. Like we're going, we're undertaking huge changes in my fire department. And I'll be honest with, I don't always agree with every one of them, but I'm trying to put myself in the place of that fire chief or that ops chief and be like, hey man, like I, maybe this this is why he thought this was the best thing. So maybe we, let, let's try and support him a little bit. And like, again, always not full disclosure, not always perfect at that, right? Like, right. you know, as we've been talking about, like I, I'm passionate, I care. And so when something rubs me the wrong way, a lot of times I speak on it and that doesn't always you know, that, that certainly hasn't always been good for my career. And it certainly isn't always great. Uh, you know, it's not always appreciated. Right. And so I, I, you know, I know I appreciate when those, when those leaders give me grace, like they know that I care and they know what I'm saying is coming from a good place. Um, and so I think that's what we need to do at the kitchen table instead of just killing each other and just try to, you know, try to give someone, there's people that are hurting for a lot of reasons that we don't even know. Uh, so, you know, like try to, try to take care of them, especially you company officers out there. Don't kill you. Like Andy Starnes says, says this, and I know I've been rambling for a minute, but Andy Starnes like, you never would crawl past a fire in a building, but we crawl past people burning every day in oh, our firehouses. Dude. dude that's and that's powerful. not me. That's Andy Starnes. He said, I know so. he Starnes is one of the best, <laughs> man, especially when it comes to interpersonal, man, dude, that guy, yeah. that guy hits it and gets it, man. Um, Ryan Pennington asked a question. He said, what's Rob's wrestling stage name? <laughs> I don't have a wrestling stage. I did real wrestling. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I will say. Uh, but you are the, a fan. Uh, oh, no doubt. Like, and so I will say that when I was growing up, me and my brother, we looked very similar. And anybody who knows us will will, will say that. It is so funny. Uh, we always, when we did a tag team, we would go by the name Double Vision because we looked very similar. Okay. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So the Double Vision. <laughs> double Vision. There yeah. it is. All right, pulling my notes back up, getting back to the questions. Legacy versus impact, man. Speaking of uh, Chief Andy Starnes and talking about family, this this cuts right into it. I love the short blurb you gave me and want to hear this concept fleshed out. So talk to me about legacy versus impact and what that means to you. Yes, yeah, so this all sparked a, a blog written by Ben Martin, who anybody who did like Ben, Ben and I, like, I will not, uh, like he says, I'm his best friend. I will not say that about it. I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but no, Ben, uh, Ben's awesome, man. Like we, we are partners in the fire ground commander. I worked for Ben. Um, it, like Ben, Ben and I's relationship is awesome. Like I worked for him. He helped me get promoted to Lieutenant and, and then, he's brilliant. Uh, he's, he's oh my God. brilliant. Yeah, he really is. Like, I don't, he's a, I, I, I use that term very lightly, but he is brilliant when it comes to yeah. inter, like people skills, but go ahead. He is a visionary. He really is. Uh, but he wrote a blog called Legacy versus Impact, and it talked about the the family problems that he was having. And he really put himself out there. And And I read that and I was like, man, this is I, I'm in turmoil as well. And so Legacy versus Impact is more about where you're actually putting your time and and what and don't get them conflicted. Right. Like I'm a firm believer that your legacy is at home with your family. You can make an impact at work and you should make an impact at work, but your legacy is not at work in the firehouse. In five years from, from the time you retire, no one's going to know who you were. Mm. I'm telling you, no one's going to remember you unless you were like, maybe like a world famous guy, but like, like the fire chief who hired me, no one knows who he is. Like uh, you talk to guys who came on today, nobody knows who Chief Mastin is. You talk to guys that I came up with who I thought were like legendary guys in Henrico Fire, nobody knows who they are. I was talking about one of them at the kitchen table the other day, and people were like, "Who's that?" I was right. like, "Oh my god, you don't know, you don't know Jimmy Mac? Like what the heck? Like you know, like have you never heard of him? Um, you know." And so, but so those guys make a tremendous impact on people, but their legacy. It, it, but but the, it's fleeting, right? Like the fire service keeps moving. The train keeps moving. Uh, the but tones home, keep dropping. The calls keep right. coming in, man. That's right, man. And and so, but at home, I mean, we still, we still tell stories about my great, great, great grandfather. You know yes. what I mean? Like that's your legacy, right? Like your legacy is at home with your family. And so I'm not saying that the job's not important. It is. And you need to put time into the job. I, I need to have my fire department cup full. 
right? Like I got to, and, and, and I do some things to make that better uh, so that I can accommodate that thing. But man, like my kids and my wife and my hopefully grandkids and my nieces and nephews, they're going to be the ones that remember me when I'm gone. They're going to be the, like, if you walk into our dining room here, my, I have my grandfather's retirement plaque on the wall. We have uh, uh, military pictures of my wife's family. We have like great, great grandparents. Like we, 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 that's who the legacy is for. And that's what the legacy is all about. And they all made tremendous impacts where they, where they were, where they worked. Right. Like my grandfather was a pipe fitter. Like there was freaking a million pipe fitters at his funeral. Right. But nobody who works at DuPont today knows him. Right. right? Like, like they, they just don't. But right. I remember everything about him. And I tell my kids that and they're going to tell their kids that and like all and so on and so on. And like I said, I remember things about my dad's grandfather that he's told me. And, yes. and, and so it's just that's where your legacy is at, man. And you can do a lot of things at home. And I'll be quite honest, man. Like, I don't think I wasn't a bad father, but a lot of times I chose the fire service over my family. Oh, Especially dude, the fire, when they were young. The, oh, the fire service is super seductive yeah. and, and, and powerful in replacing those things that are most important. Without a Absolutely. doubt, man. Without a doubt. Yeah, it'll I, I it'll would, do it in a heartbeat and you won't even realize that it's happening. Yep. And I and I'm, you know, and again, like I'm glad that I kind of got snapped in reality. But like I would totally like, no, no, I'm gonna go work overtime or I'm gonna go to this class versus go to a little league game. And that's time I'll never get back, but I'm so glad that, and really what, what drew me into it, what drew me back into it was uh, taking over as the head wrestling coach uh, for the youth team. Cause then it was like, Hey, I can't, I, I, I've dedicated not only to my kids, but these 30 other kids, like they're depending on me. Right. So, and, and, and that's the stuff that people are going to remember, man. Like, so my dad's been a firefighter my whole life. He worked as an industrial firefighter. He retired. He worked, I mean, for, for years and years, <clears throat> And in a couple of years, like there are people now that work in the department he retired from that don't know who he is. He's only been retired a year and that don't know who he is, don't remember him. But there are still people in our town that call him coach. When he goes to the store, there are people that call him coach. And that's legacy. And he hasn't, yeah, and that's legacy, yeah. right? That's legacy. He hasn't coached in 30 years. <laughs> I mean, like, like, but but that's what people, you know, remember. And like, we'll always remember you know, that. And so that's what I mean by legacy versus impact, man. And I don't mean to diminish the fire service piece of it. You can have a tremendous impact in your fire service. There are going to be people who you impacted their Ben Martin has impacted my career Mine. and he has probably left a legacy for me, but there, but, but when he's gone, man, like five, 10 years after he's gone, well, the, people are just not going to remember who he was that, you know, they're not projects that you worked on that you think are going to revolutionize the fire department, man. There's going to be down the road, they're going to be done or changed or someone else is going to revisit them or, you know, like I helped write the the lieutenants and captains promotional test. It's already been rewritten. Yep. Like, <laughs> you know but, what I mean? It's already, they brought a new group in to rewrite the next version. So like the it's tones keep dropping, the rigs keep rolling and, and people keep, yeah, dude. Yeah, so. But it, so but it is, I mean. it is seductive, man. I want to say like, it's really, it has ruined a lot of relationships, a lot of families, a lot of marriages and, and just, dude, I love your message is being hyper aware of legacy versus impact and where your legacy resides, man. That's strong. And, I, and, I, and I'm lucky, man. Like I, I, I'm not as, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I married a woman who understands the passion that I have for this. Uh, you know, again, her, her, she works for our state office of EMS. She's a certified firefighter. Her family was all EMS related. So like, I'm very lucky, but not everybody has that. Right. Not everybody has that support system at home. So you have to make that adjustment as a, as a parent, father, partner, spouse, whatever you want to call it and make sure that you're not, you know, and make sure that you're not like tilting out of balance. Right. No, no, hundred percent. And, and, and the crazy part is, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, uh, cause part of the deal is the fire service emergency service, whatever you want to say is it's real easy to get out of whack because oh yeah, you're dealing with life and death, you know? So Every you come, you come home from a shift where you just, you know, did CPR for 30 minutes, getting somebody to a hospital, to a level one trauma or whatever. And, and your wife is complaining about, uh, insert whatever you didn't put your laundry in the laundry basket or, or a light is burned out on the back porch. And you're like, <laughs> Why would I give a shit about this? But, yeah, right. but it's easy to get out of whack because mm -hmm. you've lost perspective, man. And, and that's a yeah. strong, strong message, man. 
and I can tell you just recently, my kids were wrestling in Virginia Beach, right? And I worked a shift before that. Literally, like right at shift change, I've given my turnover to the relief battalion and a fire comes out. And you know it's a I mean, it's it's that address that it is, it is a fire. It's a working yeah, multiple fire. callers, reported flames, yes. Cops yeah. on scene, yes, everything. And I am supposed to do a two hour drive to Virginia Beach to watch my kids wrestle. And I paused. I'm like, I want to go on this fire. Yeah. Like, I want to go on this fire, man. I want to go on this fire, but I, but I shouldn't. I shouldn't. And so, like, I'm like, nope, nope, I'm not, I'm not going. I'm not going. I go get in the shower. I grab the portable, though, because he leaves. The battalion leaves. I grab the portable radio that's still at the firehouse, and I'm taking a shower, and I'm listening. And sure enough, on scene, it's a working fire. I'm like, like, touch <sighs> the wall, you know? And then, like, so I change. I get, I head down. I start heading to 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 Virginia Beach. I call my wife and I'm like, God dang it, I missed a fire, blah. And so probably the first hour of that ride, I was pissed. <laughs> Just angry. I ain't gonna lie. I ain't gonna lie. But then as I, I calmed down, but then we the kids had such a great day. Yeah. Like my son, my older son, beat a kid that he wasn't supposed to beat. You know what I mean? Like had yeah. such a great and I'm like and I'm sitting there at our hotel at our at our hotel that evening, me and my wife are sharing a beverage and I'm like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where I'm supposed to be today. And hopefully that good karma will come back and I'll get to go to a fire. Right. You know? But you know what I mean? Like hopefully that like will come back and, and that whole being a good father thing will come back and I'll get to go to a fire on shift. Right. But like, but that's the whole legacy where the kids do not give a crap that I missed a fire, right. but they are going to remember forever that I was so at that there. wrestling You tournament. were there when he beat the guy he wasn't supposed to beat. Exactly. Man, dude, you can't beat that, man. <laughs> dude, first things first, uh, Huge mantra, man. Huge mantra. Uh, suburban firefighting. Talk to me about it. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what, uh, that's what I am, man. Like that's my, that is my, uh, like my pedigree, right? Like suburban and actually rural. Uh, I mean, that's where I came up in, uh, grew up in Mechanicsville, Hanover County, um, which unfortunately Hanover County is mostly known for slicers these days. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I digress, but that's where I came up at. And that was a, a tremendous opportunity where a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I got my pedigree doing like some things that like are probably like not above board, right? Like going uh, driver only to a, uh, to a vehicle fire or, oh, wow. you know, yeah. I mean like that, that was a unique experience, right? Like, but then, you know, working in Stafford County, all, all, uh, you know, uh, suburban uh, Henrico County, all suburban where just, you know, your tactics are different, right? Like we, uh, we do some, and, and that's the thing too. Like we tried to emulate some big city stuff and it just, it, it, some of it works, but a lot of it doesn't, man. Like I can't carry everything that the FDNY truck company carries on a three person truck. Right. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that, and I see this on fire videos, I even see it in our own department, uh, in a suburban fire environment or rural fire environment, everybody's got to be a soldier right? Everybody's got to be a soldier on that fire ground, right? Like you can't have any, any bystanders, like, cause everybody's got to be working. Uh, one of the big things that I preach and I started doing, uh, as a driver and as now is that I, I ride up on a battalion more. And when I was a station captain is drivers being in their turnout gear, even engine company drivers. Cause I look at it as, uh, you know, Miss Smith, like she shows up and like, you're the engine driver, right? You go to the house fire and your officer and your firefighter, cause we're only riding with three driver, officer, firefighter. That's what I mean by three person engine. Right. When you, they disappear into the, uh, into the smoke and Mima pops her head out the window and you're the only one out there, what you going to do. Right. And so I, I think I know what we're going to do, right? No matter how you're dressed, if you're in your station gear, if you're in, you know, nothing, you're going to probably go get me mall, right? So dress for success, set yourself up for, for success in that situation. Have your pants, have your turnout coat on, have your helmet on while you're pumping the rig. And then if me mall pops out the window, man, you can go up there and get her, right? You can go up there. You can reach in the window and grab me mall, right? Or right. like your officer falls through the floor uh, as he crests the door, man, you're in a great spot, like throwing the air. You're, you're 30 seconds away from throwing on an air pack, throwing on a mask, and going in there and being able to help versus being a, yeah, a point and like, yeah, something's wrong with Johnny right in there. there. Something going yeah, on. Yeah, something's going on right there. Um, hey, Ricky, and that's a, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm walking on you. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's fine. But that is one of the things that like I get a lot of, uh, I guess, weird responses from, right? Or like like sideways looks and, and, and especially like maybe from some urban guys or some city guys, right? Like, that like their drivers are just drivers, right? Like they have chauffeurs and they're assigned and that's all they do is pump the rig and, 
and it, but that's not reality for us. I mean, we have I, being in a in a rule company. I was a, 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 a captain in our rule company, where essentially I, I call it the fractured engine company, where we have a tanker in the station, and anything in the first do, we drop the third firefighter to drive the tanker. So I had to change up my whole officer routine, right? Like hydrant area, get off, like, you know, grab a hook in the, uh, grab a hook in the, uh, the tick, run around, do the 360, throw your mask on, give the shot, blah, blah, blah. Now as a company officer pulling up on a two person engine, before I leave that rig, I'm pulling a line to the front door. Like, right. you know, I'm pulling a line to the front door. I'm, I'm changing what I do. And so I think that's something that's underappreciated in the suburban fire service is that like, you gotta be a soldier. You cannot be just standing by and looking at things. And 100%. I'll be quite, and I'll be quite honest with you, man. Like, uh, like a lot of guys idolize the, you know, the, the bigger cities, right. The FD and wise, the DC is a big one here. Well, sure. Uh, the like big urban wise. departments, man. Why, why wouldn't right. you No, hundred percent. I get it. Yeah. But I can tell you, like I came up in a volunteer fire department where we had two engines, a ladder truck and a rescue company and a brush truck. So I was exposed to being what I call a utility player very early on. Right on. <laughs> and so, and, and so, but that's always been what's exciting to me. Um, and then I went to work for Stafford County, where we was a, we were a two person shift when I when I worked there. You put your gear in the floor, and there was an ambulance, an engine, and the, one of the stations I was at was very similar to my volunteer department. It had a rescue, a ladder truck, ambulance, and an engine. So you put your stuff in the floor, and you went with what came out. Right. So if that was a ladder truck, you're hopping on the ladder truck. Right. I remember one right. one day I drove everything in that firehouse. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, but that's that's a unique environment. And so yes. what, what I what I mean by that is that like a lot of those guys in urban departments, they do the same thing every day. Right. They they like if you're an FDNY and like and you're the bar guy, you're the bar guy. Yeah, you show right? up and you, you go are, to four fires and you do the same right. thing at every fire. Yeah. You do the same thing at every fire, right? Whereas in suburban land and rural land, man, I'm doing something different every day, especially like I mean, in our department, uh, we just got rid of this, but in our department for the for as long as it's been ex in existence, everybody had to get cleared to drive. So, like one day I'd show up to an engine company and I'd be the driver, one day I'd be the acting officer, and one day I'd be the backwards firefighter. And then I'd have to go drive the ambulance. Right. So that's always been very interesting to me, right? Like that's like I, I might would I mean I'm not I probably wouldn't get bored going to four fires a day as the bar guy, but uh man, I liked I've always enjoyed that variety that the urban fire sir the suburban fire service has has given me. And I've been able to like again, I, I'm not an expert in anything. Like I'm not your I'm not the go to guy. Uh, for a hall system, but I know how to do it because I've been exposed to so much of it. Like, you know, and I've, I've done truck company work and rescue company work and engine company work. And now I'm, I ride up on a battalion car and, and all like, I mean, I've gotten to do so many things and that's without even delving into the specialty team stuff. Like I haven't even touched a specialty team in my 18 year career. I don't right. know anything about a, a boat or a hazmat or, you know, or anything like that. And so there's just so many unique things about that suburban fire department that I, that I just love. And I mean, I'm a suburban fire department guy. My brother, he's a city guy. He works for the city of Richmond and, and he likes that aspect of it. He likes, you know, the, the urban work. And, and I, you know, and I, and I like being able to touch that every once in a while, but man, I, I just feel like what I'm really good at and the skill set that I have. And a lot of the skill sets of people that I work with, man, that suburban environment is just so challenging, so taxing and, and, no, uh, no, man, and so it, interesting. It is the, uh, Probably a if you did a cross cut of the American Fire Service, it it represents a lot of of I am the American Fire Service. If you if you could put, if you could put a sticker on it, so catch you up on some of this smoothbore cartel. Kyle said task saturated manpower limited fires are my favorite. All work and nowhere <laughs> to hide, man. That's right. There is nowhere to hide when it, when it is that. Uh, there's been some talk about who is the better Owens brother. I'll let. <laughs> I'll let the internet decide that stuff. Come to work to do work. Rock on, Rob. Could talk to him 24-7. That's Ryan Pennington chiming in. Great conversation. Absolutely, man. No, a lot of a lot of good stuff here. And and guys, absolutely, if you get a chance, put your questions in to, to throw at Robbie because this is your chance to ask him. And Kyle has one for you from Ramagan saying, what was the reaction locally when Slicers came out? So you mentioned Slicers, so I have to bring it up. Uh, yeah, that's right. And what were your thoughts on it then and now? Because 
and, I'll, and I'll, before you answer, I'll say, man, I bought into slicers. I taught my guys slicers. I was heavy into slicers. It was beautiful, man. And yeah. go ahead. What? What? Yeah. I, so, so I'll tell you the the reaction locally, and again, knowing those guys, like the guy, like Eddie Buchanan. He taught my firefighter one class. He taught my firefighter two class. I've known the guy since I was 15 years old. So like I I, I got nothing but respect for Eddie. You know what I mean? Like uh you know he was the very first instructor I ever had. So uh, but I can say the reaction was mixed here locally, right? Like some people thought that it meant that we were never going into a fire right. ever again, and and all that kind of stuff. And and personally, I interpreted it as a really good acronym. Uh, which may lead into our other to another topic, but uh, a really good acronym for an engine company, right? Like Recio, I think is really good for like a command officer, right? And Slicers was like perfect for an engine company, I thought. But I, I think you can interpret what the rules or, or the or the or the words mean uh, in your own thing. Like to me, uh, what was it? It was like confined from or, or you know locate and confined from yeah, a size safe of area locate, or isolate, yeah. confine. Yeah. yeah, or like confined from a safe area well to me a safe area could be down the hall right that doesn't mean outside it doesn't mean outside to me i don't know if it means outside to anybody else out there but like if i'm an engine company and i'm and i do my side and i locate the fire and i identify the flow path and and then i go inside oh the fire's down the hallway okay well i'm gonna start flowing water like i'm in a safe area like you know the fire's in the bedroom i'm safe you right. know relatively speaking if there, if there is a safe place on the ground you know i've taken all the steps to be safe right i'm in all my ppe and i'm wearing my mask and i've done my size up and i've identified you know like i've done all those steps to be safe right so i'm locating the fire and confining it from a safe area then i'm extinguishing it which is what our goal is every time um but i actually thought it was a really good acronym for an engine company and here's the thing too man like talking about that suburban versus urban maybe it's not for you right maybe yes. it's maybe it's not for you Maybe if you are rolling deep on a six-person engine company, it, it probably isn't for you because a lot of those things are happening simultaneously. But for me, when I'm the working boss as an engine company officer, when I'm running around doing a 360, doing a size up, giving orders, pumping hose, maybe it is for me, right? right. Like maybe that works for me, right? Like yes. so. So I so I think and I think there's still some controversy over it here locally, man. Like there and there's some people that interpret it their way and that's with everything right like that whole like rescues and action of opportunity well hasn't it always been like re if i have the opportunity to rescue someone i usually try to wherever it falls in whatever thing that you're doing right so no matter so i don't uh, yeah no matter what right as a battalion chief if i show up first and meemaw is hanging out the window i say meemaw a lot because i have a meemaw sure. um but like so but like you know meemaw's hanging out the window and if I can effect a rescue as a battalion, I'm gonna do it, right? Like I, I, I don't, I don't know why that's such a, a controversial take. No, I, uh, and, and this is my thing is, is like because because rescue fell at uh, slice R. Yeah. So uh, it fell at the end, and I, I don't know. Is it really just because of the packaging that it, that it just fell on probably so yeah. badly? It's like rescue is at the end. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. Well, and you know, and, and unfortunately, I think talking about that suburban urban thing again, I think people were like, where is this Hanover County and how dare they change our fire service? Right. Right. Like, I think that there was a big thing like, who who are these people? Right. Like, where are they from? And I'm like, geez, man, I live here. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, what I mean, like I'm from this. I'm, I'm sure. born and bred like mechanics of volunteer fire department in Hanover County. Right. Like I live in Hanover County. They protect me. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, right so, on. you know, so like I, I have, I have faith, you know, a lot of my buddies uh, work for Hanover Fire and EMS. Right. So, so yeah, I think that was some of it too, right. This didn't come from, and I think that's one of the big things with the, the studies that have come out, right. Like with, uh, and I think UL was smart. UL was smart. They got DC and FDNY and, and like all these big hitters on board with the recent, with all the, 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 the studies here recently. And that's why, and I think it was more widely accepted when there was well, really I, I, probably I, nothing wrong with slicers. Not only, but not only widely accepted, but also uh, vetted. Yeah. Going into the, the the actual, like they changed the parameters that 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 were studied, the variables yeah. that were implemented. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Because because of who they involved. Yes, absolutely. 
So, and and totally good stuff, right? Like not dissing any of that, but like I definitely think there was a stigma. Like if my fire department, who in Virginia is very large, but like if we tried to put something out like that, it would probably have some scrutiny to it. Like who are these guys from Henrico? Because in, right. they wouldn't say Henrico, they would say Henrico because that's how everybody pronounces it. And you know, so, was, so. <laughs> you know, but that's you know, but like that's the deal, right? Like that's. You know, we, we're always like kind of bowing down to Fairfax because they're the biggest in Virginia. They're, right you know, they're, they're the guys. So I think there is some stigma with that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't think it matters that much, man. Like, you know, if, if, if it works for you, it works for you. No, I love it, man. And you talked about acronyms, which is one of the things you wanted to talk about. So I'll, I'll let you talk. We've been talking about slicers, but acronyms yeah. in general. Yeah, I, I just. I don't get the get the hate right like uh, on the acronym stuff like if if that helps you at 2 a.m. cool I don't necessarily need them right and I certainly usually don't run around the house going you know like Recio VS you know what I mean or like as I'm doing my 360 but uh if if acronyms help you and they're a learning tool then use them man I, I don't get the hate uh of it I mean and I teach uh, an acronym for doing a size up. Uh, I call it the four B's of the 360: burning bodies, bombs, and basements. Right, I like and it. I have had I have had people that tell me that that works for them. Right, it helps them remember what they're looking for. Right, like burning is any potential fire, uh, you know, or a fire location, or like reading smoke. That's what you're looking for in burning bodies. Any victims visible or any potential victim locations? Uh, bombs, anything that'll kill you. You know, like right. you know, like a, a down power line, a propane tank, a hole in the yard. Yeah, dangerous. And then a, yeah, dangerous. And then a basement, right? Like the, uh, that sub level, right? Yeah. Anything like a crawl space or anything like that. If that helps you remember to do that at four in the morning, awesome, man. If you don't need it, again, like we talked about, maybe it's not for you. Right. Right. Maybe it's not for you. That's okay if it's not for you. That's fine. Like, but why do we got to hate on something that might actually help somebody? Like we're very like a lot of the kids we're getting today, uh, they're coming from an EMS background and they like I know in our academy, EMT is the first thing that they do. And they're pushing these kids to go get paramedics so fast. It's crazy. And they follow protocols and it's a protocol based. It's an algorithm based, which is essentially what an acronym is, man. It's like a it's a it's an algorithm that's just that's uh, using a memory aid. Right. That's all it is. So these kids understand that. And maybe it'll help some kid at three in the morning uh, right. not miss a step. And you know, but like if you don't need it, cool. But if that kid needs it, why do you care? And that's kind of like another tangent I go on, like what like what we call things. People are like wanting a specific jargon in the fire service. Like, man, I, I don't care uh, what someone in California calls a split level, right? Like here in Henrico Fire, I call it a split level house or a trial level house, right? And as long as everybody in Henrico Fire knows what that means. That's cool, man. Like, I, it doesn't matter, you know. Like, if I came out to to your fire department, Corley, and you and you had and you, and you had a different phrase, well, if I'm going to work for you, I should learn that phrase. I should learn that thing, you know. Uh, when I was in college, we had a guy, and it's so funny. You're only as smart as where you're standing in the world. I'm telling you. And I had a guy go, "Hey, man, go get a pencil ladder." I looked at him like he was crazy. I was like, "I don't know what that is." He's like, "What do you mean you don't know what a pencil ladder is? I thought you were a fireman." Like, well, yeah, man, I am, but I don't know what a pencil ladder is. And he's like, oh, th-, and he meant an attic ladder, what we call an attic ladder, the folding little right, tiny ladder right. that we stick in a skull hole. We call that an attic ladder where I'm from, bro. Like, right. I don't know what a pencil ladder is. Um, so, so, but like, as long as everybody in, and he was from Southboro, Massachusetts, but everybody in Southboro, Massachusetts knows what a pencil ladder is, right? So, and everybody here where I work knows what an attic ladder is. That's what we call it. So if, if you, as long as everybody knows that, I don't understand why we, where we got to hate on the acronym. I don't know what's saying, what we got to hate on, you know, like, no, it's this. And I mean, I got into a, a, a heated discussion with a guy over tri-level versus split level. I'm like, they're two different things. <laughs> and he's like, they're not two different things. They're the same thing. I'm like, no, literally a tri-level has three levels. A split level only has two. Come on, man. This isn't hard. You know? And he like got like, he was like, no, they're the same thing. And I even showed him a picture and it was like, nope, they're two different. They're, they're, they're the same house. I'm like, oh my gosh. But like everybody where we work knows the difference. Like knows without a doubt, without a doubt, is. like 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 tactics are local, man. You have yeah, to it's very absolutely regional. have to absolutely know your. The best way to stay safe is to know your district. 
I mean, Absolutely. Without it, know your job, know your district. And I, and I there's nothing ever going to beat that. And so, yeah, yeah I can't. I'm with you, man. But, like it's a, uh... but I do like the idea to push towards a, a common jargon also at the mm-hmm. same time. So for me, it's, it's a, it's a, as the internet and all of its negativity also yeah. <laughs> and all of its positivity, but I would like to see us push towards a point where maybe someday we could have a common jargon that, that applies to everything and at the same time, recognizing the fact that until we get there, you have to know your district first. Yeah. And, and, but like, like we talked about earlier, like showing them, like that's where some of these, the internet is awesome. I mean, I'm the kid who used to go to firehouse expo and have his dad buy him a VHS tape of like LA fires. Right. right. So like the fact that we have YouTube and Dave Statter right. and all these things that I can like access all this information is awesome. But like we talked about too, like you got to give grace to some of these guys, man. Like they may have a different experience. So, and, and some of these guys that put some of this stuff out there, they're not, they're not thinking of that, that suburban firefighter or rural firefighter who can't apply those urban tactics because they don't have the manpower or the building construction's not the same or all that stuff. So I think there's a, there are some things that we can common have some commonalities with, but man, like you said, like it is regional, man. Like, like I, I can't, uh, like we, we don't do business the same way as our neighbors in the city of Richmond do. Cause it's a completely, I mean, you're talking about a revolutionary, you know, war city, right? you know, right. versus a suburban County, right. right? Like we don't do things the same, right? No, like, and, and we shouldn't, and there's no comparison. The Absolutely. And, right. and, uh, Brian Schwab chimed in and said the best time to pre-plan residential houses in your district is while you're on medical calls. And I, I, perfect. I, I, yes. I'm hundred percent agreement with them. Man, this, like, you want to talk about one of the things that is like, like been controversial in my department, like before we leave an EMS call, I'll make, all right, hey, give me a size up of that building. Hey, where were the bedrooms? What was the lock on the door? Uh, you know, and then like, if it, do, if it doesn't look like it's crazy, like I'll even be like, hey, stretch a line. Right. Or like I carry a measuring wheel with me and I'm like, all right, d- we played the guesstimate the stretch game. All right, like, hey, if you're going to pull the cross leg, like how far is it from here to the door? How far is it from here? And then I'll measure it, see if we were right. right. Right, like, hey, there's a hydrant down the street. Go drive down the hydrant, turn it, you know, make sure all the caps come off, turn it on, test it. Uh, all those things. And I, and that gets you sets and reps on a real house in your district. So like, I'm not saying ignore Mima, right? Like go in there, make sure she's okay. Put her in the thousand ambulance. percent. Yeah. Take a look around. You people are inviting you into their house. Take, take a care look of business so and then the take care of business, man. There you go. Exactly. I love like, it, well, like, and if you do that, like if your fire department isn't going to enough fires, right? If you do that, think about how, I mean, you're not going to a fire, right? But like, think about how many fires you can go to that day, right? Like Dude. if I go to 10 EMS calls, I went to 10 houses in Dude, my I district. I challenge my guys all the time. Like, like guess the layout of the house, right? Yeah. And, and when you go inside and you're, and you're taking the blood pressure and you're, and you're getting the blood sugar, whatever. And like, God, man, I really screwed up trying to guess the layout of this house. But if you do it enough, if you do it every time, then when it is three in the morning and you roll up on it, you'll do it without thinking about it. Absolutely. And, and you'll absolutely realize where the bedrooms are, where the hallway's at, where the kitchen. Yeah, dude, man, but you have to do it on purpose. It will yeah, not happen well, on it's, accident. It's, it's got to be intentional. And again, like, again, do it within reason, right? If it's 4 a.m. and you're on your fifth medical call yes. after midnight, go back to bed. Yes. Right. But like, I'm all, but like, you should always try to point out something unique on a real call in a real building in your district. You should always be looking to do that. Um, you know, a special lock or something, or even like a unique layout, uh, anything like that. And like I said, if it's not too fraught, like if it's, if it doesn't look weird, like I'm a big believer in let's stretch that line to the door. It takes 10 minutes. And that's some of the best training that you can do is like, Hey man, I, all right, we pulled up and I tell my driver, like when I'm riding in charge of an engine park, don't park the engine. Like we're trying to leave park it like we're positioning for a fire. Yes. So either stop short or pull past. Angle your bumper if you're going to use the bumper line or angle the angle the cross lay, you know, to the door, like all that kind of stuff. Like so so that we get that set and repping for everybody. Yes. We had a thing we actually do critiques on and but we had a critique where one of the older guys asked me is like, "Hey, do we really need to set up the ladder on every fire we go on?" And yeah. I, and no, but <laughs> and my no, my answer was to him. I, I was like, "No, absolutely not. We do not." I was like, but 
until we absolutely get it right on every fire we go on, we're going to continue to do it. And when we get it right, then we can then we can back off. Yep. But until we actually get it right, then let's keep doing it. So yeah. uh, I worked for a guy who was big on that. Like when I was a dr- truck driver, it was, hey, just go ahead and set the truck. Why not? Yes. R- yes. Rule it in. Rule it in. Don't rule it out. No, rule it in. And, and it's just, it's different on the scene of a smoke investigation or whatever it is, you know, uh, with power lines and everything else going on and, and cars in the street and mm-hmm. insert whatever, as opposed to the front pad where you just raise it up, yeah. rotate. Yeah. You spin and then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> spin it and bet it. You know, no, yeah. it's different. You get actual real world reps, man. Absolutely. And hundred percent. Hey, we start knocking it out of the park and crushing it on every smells and bells whistle we go on. Then we'll quit doing it. But until then, yeah. When, yeah, hey, no, when I'm, I'm down with it. Yeah, but no, okay. Uh, dude, I love asking people, especially people I respect, book or books that you think firefighters should be reading. Um, so, man, I'm a pretty big reader. It, it takes me a long time to read, though, because, like, when I read, I'm, like, an underliner, right in the margins guy, like, all that kind of stuff. Like, so it, it takes me a while to consume yes. books. But now, uh, some of the ones, like, Anything by Jocko, I, I dig all his stuff. Yes. I've got every one of his books. Um, I've even got the Way of the Warrior Kids books. Like, I've got them for my kids. And I've actually read them. They're great. Um, the, uh, But I would say, like, it, it, like, so I've had some books like like uh, Leadership Values that uh, Bobby Eckert recommended. Uh, man, that was a powerful book. So I recommend anybody lead, uh, read that. But uh, there's some books that, that are, like, from my wrestling background, Dan Gable, A Wrestling Life. Man, if you want to talk about a, a guy, if, if, if you want to feel like you're not motivated, read A Wrestling Life by Dan Gable. Okay. Uh, that is awesome. He talks about his his training that he undertook. He talks about his personal tragedy that has had, like, not a lot of people know that his sister was murdered. Um, and it talks about how he came back from that and was able to win uh, national titles in high school and Olympic gold medal and all this, all wow. the training that he did and the motivation, the coaching. I mean, it, it's a really, really, really great book, even if you're not a wrestling guy. And uh, for firefighting, I, one of the best books I've ever read on firefighting, and it's not very popular because of some of the tactics discussed in it, but from a fire behavior perspective, 3D firefighting. It's by a uh, group of authors like Paul Grimwood, Ed Hart, okay. and all this kind of stuff. Now, and it's and it talks a lot about some Euro tactics. Is it European? Like, no, that's when, yeah, when you say Grimwood, also, I'm like instantly going, like, yeah, is that yeah. European? <laughs> yep, yep. Exactly. It talks okay. about some European tactics, but the fire behavior knowledge in it and like water application and what water really do- I mean, they were doing some of the stuff Nist and UL were doing back in like the early eighties. Hey, I don't I don't um, downplay the really. Swedes or the Europeans uh, yeah, man no. when they come to their science, man, their compartment firefighting has a lot a lot of value. Absolutely. Like I said, it's some of the best fire behavior stuff I've ever read. So three D firefighting I always Always, always recommend that compartment. Um, I mean, I, I don't remember who published compartment firefighting, but man, yeah, that, that, uh, that I think it was Ed, it was Ed Harton, the, the, yeah. the like CFBT, yeah, like, yeah, dude, it, it, yeah, you had to get a translation of it, but <laughs> no, it, it was super, super uh, applicable, you know. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, anyway, like I said, you don't have to dig the tactics, but like the knowledge of what fires are doing yes. in these things, it, that that's completely applicable. Like like you said, to what we do and like. And it's stuff that's that's been out there for decades. Temperatures, um, and, pressures, and and how it interacts, yeah. man. Yeah, 100%. they were called, like what we call flow path. Like they had a different word for. They're called like overpressure, underpressure. Right. But, like they were talking about flow paths in the eighties over in Europe, and we were like, no, like I opened up and you know, and and, that, and I'm guilty, man. Like I, that's who taught me. You know, like I came up with a belt mounted regulator and a uh, and a uh, elephant tube. Like that's what I learned on. So right. I came up in that in that era. So <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful, man. All right. So we have a thing on the weekly scrap It is called the five questions for firefighters It has evolved into the next five questions for firefighters. The answers are 100% your opinion. There is no right or wrong. And the points are completely arbitrary. And apparently everybody gets max points, but <laughs> that's not, that's not the point. Um, my friend, Robbie Owens, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Absolutely. Let's do it. All right, here we go. What, number one, what single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier go-to badass firefighter? I think it just comes down to your give-a-shit. Like, if you want to be good and you give a shit, 
then you're going to be a good firefighter, right? Like I, I, I've said, you know, a million times, and as long as you're giving me hard work and you're you're willing to try, man, I'll stick with you. Uh, and I think that's some of the, you know, the things that like a lot of us have in common, right? Like we talked about earlier, like none of us are perfect, man. Like none of us are perfect, but like we all keep coming back for more. We're like that Rocky Balboa, man. We just keep getting knocked down <laughs> and we keep getting, and we keep coming back and we keep coming back and we keep coming back. And that's, man, I'll take that guy over the most, the guy who's like super talented or, or, or looks the part, right? Like I'll take that grinder who just keeps coming and trying and, and not giving up. So to me, it's giving a shit, man, like coming out and coming to work and knowing that we're going to work hard and we're going to get it done today. And you might get, and you're probably going to fail some and you're going to win some, but we're going to come back the next day and we're going to keep getting after it. Dude, all I do, and this is what people don't understand. All I do is look for a reason to not give max points. You know what I'm saying? And then you come <laughs> right. out and say, give a shit. And, and like chief Thompson is one of my heroes. And he says the, the gas meter G A S yeah. give a shit, you know, the give, give a, a shit, shit meter, yeah. dude, a hundred percent, man. Max points, number one, if you give a shit, 1,000%. I love that. Okay, number two, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? Go back. You started when you were 15 years old. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know I don't know what year it was. In, but I know 2002 you started career, so I don't even <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like 95, 96. Uh, yeah, okay. So. But yeah, so, uh, man, it's so many, but I, I would just – it's probably, it, it, it's shut up and be humble. Um, man, I, you know, it was, it was, a, I came from the, I worked for the busiest, uh, or excuse me, I, I volunteered at the busiest company in Hanover, right? Like we were the busiest, right? Like, and so with that comes with company pride, right? But right. you don't have to tell everybody, you don't, and you certainly don't have, and then I got hired with Enrico and I went to the busiest company and we told everybody you know, and like, like I said, and that was the thing, like we were the busiest, but we didn't just, we didn't just let our work do the talking for us. Right. Like we not only, and I was that guy that if I thought you screwed up on a fire, I told you about it. Yes. Right. Like, and you don't have to do that, man. So I should have been way more humble. I should have been, I should have shut up a lot more. Um, you know, th that's probably the biggest pieces of advice that I would give my younger self. And it's what I tell my kids all the time, like, because they have expressed interest in this. Like, hey, man, especially coming in, like, after the legacy that we have, right, like, in, in this fire service or, or whatever. And, uh, man, just just shut up. Be humble. If somebody wants to show you how to roll some hose, even though you've done it a thousand times, just let them show you, right? Like, it's it doesn't hurt you. But instead, instead be like, I already know how to do that. Right. Like it just just shut up and be humble, man. Like you don't need to tell everybody if you are good at what you do and your good work that then you'll 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 kill it. And the people will see it coming from a mile away that you know what you're doing uh, because it'll be in how you carry yourself in your work. Love that, man. So <laughs> question one, I, I give credit to uh, Chief Scott Thompson. Question two, I say Kendrick Lamar when you say sit down, be humble. So max points. <laughs> One oh, and cool. two. No, I love it. I really do. Number three, what is your favorite training drill? Man, I, I think we, we already talked about it, man. That real life drill when you're on a real building in your district, uh, that EMS call drill or whatever, that on spot drill, mm. um, anything like that, man. Like I think it's, I think that's some of the most impactful stuff that you can do because it's real. You can only stretch. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a host stretch guy. I like doing stuff at the firehouse too. But you can only stretch that hose bundle so many times. You can only stretch in the parking lot so many times. But when you stretch that line in a real building in your district, you know, in a real yard with real obstructions, or you're walking through a real house, like there's nothing. That's the only thing besides going to a real fire that can compete, right? Like it really is. That's like, no, like you're there right. is always going to be a, a, a gap between training and experience, right? The only thing that can bridge that even closer is that real building in your district, man? Like, so I'm a, I'm a hundred percent. That's my favorite thing to do is just go and do stuff in real buildings that we really go into. Whether it's that impromptu drill, a walkthrough, um, their t uh, even you know, hope nobody's listening. Building under construction that maybe the <laughs> construction crew's not there that day. Right. Um, and we go stretch a line in there. We don't flow water, but we stretch a line. Just uh, stretch you know, or do, yeah, right. We're just stretching. Uh, we're not flowing any water, but yeah, man, anything like that is my is my favorite drill. I love it. And I'm gonna catch you up. Jim Platt said, "Awesome scrap tonight." 
It was great to put a face to a name for the average Jake. And I really do. I, I mean that. I met you and I didn't know you were the average Jake. And I have to yeah, say that. <laughs> Thank you for your time. And then uh, Bill Williams said, great job, Robbie. Way to represent oh, Henrico Fire. By the way, thanks. I remember the chief that hired you, Ron Matson. So Correct. I, wanted to, yeah. I wanted to throw those in there before I got to question four. And I will say 1,000% max points on question three. Number four, what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Um, I think probably, and, and not to get too serious, but the, the, the mistake that I've learned from the most is I was – extremely prepared on the tactical side of firefighting to become a company officer. And I was ridiculously underprepared on the people side. Mm. Um, and I did not realize that until a grown man was sitting across a desk from me that I'm getting ready to discipline because he ain't living up to Robbie's standard. What an asshole I am. And, uh, you know, getting ready to discipline him when he finally breaks down and gives me the underlying issue that's really going on with him. Um, and then I realized that I was, ill-equipped and not prepared to deal with the people side because this guy's like crying. He's spilling his guts out to me and he's got legit issues going on, man. Like this isn't like he's trying to get out of getting in trouble. This is, this is horrible, horrible stuff. And I'm like, Holy smokes, man. I, I I can't punish this guy. In fact, I got to defend him. You know what I mean? And so like I took a big risk and called up my boss and my boss's boss and was like, Hey, leave this guy alone. We've got him. You know what I mean? But like, I knew then that I did not have the people skills to do. Like, I was like, I don't know what to do. Uh, You know, the only thing I can do is stand in the way of the guys that are trying to hammer you. Um, You know, and and if they hit somebody, they'll hit me until I can figure out how to deal with the people side of things more. And so but what I did was, you know, take some classes, read some more books, uh, you know, because guess what, man? As much as I love going to fires, it ain't all about that. It's a you're spending more time in the firehouse than you're ever going to go. Uh, to a fire and so you've got to deal with the people and I was like all I ever focused on was was tactics and performance on the fire ground and not being a good people person and not being a good you know even as a firefighter I was like ah eh, whatever if the guy doesn't like me like like my reputation I didn't care about I wore that asshole as like a badge of honor not as a warning sign right so uh, I realized that when you become that officer like you can't do that anymore and so I, I had to correct that. So that's probably the biggest mistake. And it took me a long time to overcome that reputation of that. I don't give a shit about the people. I'm just all about the, the fire ground and the performance. So that's a um, huge mistake that I had. Brother, I love it, man. And this is what I want to say to you is when, uh, when that happened and it hit you and you were like, I don't know what to do. I'm not prepared for this. Your instinct was I'm going to protect this person. I'm going to take the shots and I, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not, I'm not trying to fluff you up or anything like that, but no, I, man, we need more of that in the fire service of I'm here to protect you and let's get yeah, this I mean, figured out. Unfortunately, all I could do was that, right? Like all I could do is be a shield at that point because oh, I didn't, brother, there's I, a I didn't lot have of, any, there, there, there is a <laughs> lot of things. There is a lot of things you could have done. And a lot of things that a lot of people have done that was not that. And yeah. so well, I mean, no, I, I had the write up paper there, like on the desk. Right. And like when he started giving it, like I was like slid it under the desk, man. Right. This and it's hard to problem. relate to that because I come from a good family. I don't have marital problems. You know what I mean? Like I don't have any of that stuff. So I can't even like relate to it. But like I have you have to learn how to manage it. And I just it was something that wasn't even on my radar. And so and I've conti- and it's something that I continually like have to like revisit and I, sure. and I pay attention to and I read stuff and um, and so I'm not there by any stretch and hopefully by the end of my career, I guess, I, hopefully I will be, but man, like it's, it's not an easy thing. And, and I continually, like, I, I was the guy who did not like, I thought, you know, like mental health, like what's that? Like you should just suck it up and be good at your job. Yeah. Right? Dirt like, on now, it. Like, yeah. 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 Like, I mean, and that that's wow. So, so far off base, <laughs> dude. like so far off base. And I've been lucky that like, like I've met people like Dina and yes. like, and, and, and unfortunately we've had some incidents in my department where like it really highlighted the the bad stuff that goes on in, in people's heads and, yes. and how like we failed them to be quite honest with you. And so I don't want to be a link in that chain of failing somebody, man. So I love it, man. I love it. Max points, 1000% four for four. Number five, final question, heavy fire, searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? So 
I, I've got a – so I definitely want to be on the nozzle. I'm an engine guy at heart. I've been a jack-of-all-trades utility player, whatever you want to call it in the fire service, but I have a, 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 a thing about it too. I would also – I'd want to be on the nozzle, but I'd want uh, – my dad is the driver of the engine, and I'd want my brother uh, either backing me up or being the officer uh, because that, that's something that – like we got to do that a couple times as volunteers that's awesome, and, dude. <laughs> and everything. And that's just awesome. And I don't have that. Ex- so if I had the choice, that's what I would do, man. Like my dad's probably, my dad taught me how to drive fire trucks. He's one of the best uh, engine operators I've ever met. He learned how to drive on a 52 Mac fire engine. So that dude can stem anything that's out there. I'd want him driving me. Even at 63 years old, I'd want right him in the, in the driver's seat. Right and on, my dude. brother, my brother's one of the best firemen I've ever been around. Um, you know, he's like, as everything else, like he's younger than I am, but way more talented than me at everything. I've always right. had to work twice as hard to be as good as him. So I would want no one other than him backing me up. Dude, that's one of the coolest answers I have ever had to question number five. That question has been around for 146 scraps. And I will honestly say that's one of the coolest answers I've ever had. And I don't think anybody can argue that, man. <laughs> my dad pumping the rig and my brother backing me up. So... <laughs> Ah, dude, that is one of the greatest answers to number five. Awesome. Max points across the board. There it is. The next five questions for firefighters, according to Robbie Owens, according to the average Jake uh, brother. Thank you so much. And that thank you, my friend. Officially makes it 146 scraps in the books. Uh, my friend Robbie Owens. If someone wants to get a hold of you, reach out to you. Um, how can they do that? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh... I've got the Facebook page now. So the, the average Jake firefighter blog, uh, first arriving network who I was using as blog host and they've decided to, to get away from that, which is fine. Most blogs have transitioned to, uh, to Facebook anyway. Right. Right. So the medium has changed, which is fine. I've got the Facebook page, the average Jake firefighter. Um, I've got the podcast, the average Jake firefighter podcast on Twitter and Instagram, uh, as average Jake FF. So there's lots of ways to get a hold of me, uh, private message me there. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty responsive. Um, yeah, so that, that's about it. Very love it. Okay. Do my, uh, housekeeping. Here we go. Firehousevigilant.com. The vigilantes is live. It's a private group. It's not for everybody. It's very exclusive and only for those who support the scrap and want to get involved in the scrap. Um, but it's a private group. It's called the vigilantes. It is for the insiders, the scrappiest of the scrappers, uh, once a month. In fact, the very first one is tomorrow night going live to just talk about who's going to be the guest on the scrap, what kind of questions we're going to ask, what topics we're going to discuss, and anything else that comes up that we want to talk about. Uh, very informal, but uh, if you want to be a part of it, go to firehousevigilance.com, support the scrap, and get in there. My whole deal is I want to bring value to people who support the scrap, but I never want to take away from the scrap itself and just make it out there for everybody. So uh, get involved if you want to be involved. Coming up. Uh, Kevin Fluger a few nights from now coming up on the scrap it's going to be an awesome time following that Todd Shepard then Tom Hollick that is leading into July for number 150 pretty excited about 150 I'm not going to lie uh, and I, and so I'm bringing back who was number 100 it was Kurt Isaacson so number 150 it's going to be Kurt Isaacson live from the dock he's going to bring his passion he's going to talk about people before water he's going to talk about what he's passionate about it's what he does and uh, it's going to be an awesome time. So uh, all that being said, the scraps coming up are looking sweet. My brother, Robbie Owens, thank you for being such a phenomenal guest and giving me your evening this evening. Oh, thank you, Corley. It was, it, like I said, with the caliber of people you've had on the scrap, it's an, an extreme honor. Uh, very humbled to be asked. And, and thank you, guys. And thanks, everybody, for listening and participating. Dude, it was killer. You, you absolutely crushed. Uh, my audience, uh, no matter what, you guys are what makes the scrap so amazing. Uh, there's a lot of different podcasts, a lot of different shows out there. And there's only one where you guys come in and ask questions and throw people under the bus, etc. And, and it's just a good time, man. So I appreciate you. And I can never say thank you enough. Remember mutts do not scrap. I hope the tone stays silent unless it's burning. Everybody stay face out there. <laughs>